God wants to transform, to make fabulous, to make great. And this morning I'm going to speak about money. I see on TV they have these money makeover shows. Well, God wants to do a money makeover. This is not a, a teaching on giving, so you can relax. <laughs> it's, a, it's a teaching on thinking about money the way God does. And that will help us uh, arrive where God wants us to arrive. We're all going to go, we're all going to end up somewhere. And the somewhere depends on the path we take. Now, the path that <laughs> God wants his children to take is uh, he wants us to be debt free. He wants us to have a retirement. He wants us to have an emergency fund other than our credit card as our emergency fund. And uh, <laughs> he wants us to have more money than months. And uh, literally, he wants us to have a surplus, to live a lifestyle that creates surplus money. That's stuff that's left over. It's, it's a concept, it's just from God. You have to work on it. But <laughs> And when you do it God's way, you uh, find out that it's a lot less stress and you're a lot happier. Uh, finances uh, uh, are a very important part of our life and it's the biggest cause of divorce, the biggest contributor to divorce. And God says, I don't want you to be a slave to anybody. I want you to be debt free. Now, first thing after Easter, we have class after class called Financial Peace University. That's as opposed to financial turmoil and stress <laughs> and this is God's plan in its fullest and so shame on us if all you've heard the church of Jesus Christ say give me your money that's not what God's saying he's saying please let me bless you abundantly and here's how it works and uh, uh, so try some of those concepts so <laughs> we've been looking at 50 days of transformation and uh you picked a great Sunday to be here. <coughs> if this is your first Sunday, I'm sorry. <laughs> first Sunday and he's going to preach on Monday. Yeah, but actually, you have to remember that God's intentions are for good, to bless us, not curse us, to, not, uh, to give us a hope in the future. All of the things that God has, including his teaching about money, and then after you've done the first class university, there's another thing called legacy. What do you do with now that you've got your finances in order and now you have uh, reserves and you have some financial energy, how do you leave a legacy? So God's teaching goes quite deep into this area. We've looked at spiritual health, physical health, mental health, emotional health, relational health, two more dimensions to go, work and money. This week, we want to look at financial health. Now, it may surprise you that Jesus talked about money more than he did heaven or hell. And if you get into Matthew, Mark, and Luke, every sixth verse <laughs> was Jesus teaching about money. Why so much? Because money dominates our life. And uh, you'll find out that people will do weird things to get money. And sometimes we <laughs> get so energetic at getting money, they wind up in jail. We work for it. We study it. We save it. We invest it. We do a whole bunch of things with it. We worry about it. But if you don't learn to manage your money, your money will manage you. If you don't learn to manage your money, your money will manage you. And all your decisions will be based on the financial place you have put yourself in. God says, I don't want you to be encumbered by money. Be free. Here's how you do it. Don't have that stuff pulling away at your life. Walk away. Now, <clears throat> he tells a story. And again, it's about finances, but it's not about giving. Relax, 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 relax. There's an offering at the end of the service. All right, now. Here is what it's about. <clears throat> Jesus said, there was once a rich man. It's a story, it's a parable, and out of it he wants us to learn some lessons. There was once a rich man who enlisted a manager to take care of his property, but the manager was accused of wasting his master's possession. So the owner called him in and said, you must give me an account of your stewardship, of what I entrusted to you, must and report... <laughs> <laughs> you must now give an account of your stewardship and report what you've done with your what I entrusted you to you <laughs> because your time 
as a manager is ending. Manager thought, what am I going to do now? I'm losing my job, and I'm not strong enough to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. <laughs> I love this guy. And <laughs> you know what I'll do? So after I lose my job, I'll have plenty of friends to take care of me. So he called in everybody who was in debt to his master, and he said to the first man, how much do you owe the master? 800 gallons of olive oil. Manager says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Tear up that bill and write a new bill that says you owe 400 gallons. Man, the owner's not in on this. It's just the manager, okay? Next, the manager found another debtor, and he says, how much do you owe? Guy says, 1,000 bushels of wheat. Says, okay, change your bill to say that you only owe 800. Yeah, this is really under the table. Now, the master heard what the dishonest manager had done, and he still praised his shrewdness. For worldly people are more shrewd in handling their affairs than those who belong to the light. What a strange story. He's got a crook as a hero. Go Jesus. All right. <clears throat> he says, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. Use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. He's talking about uh, eternity in heaven and life with him. He wants us to be set up with relationships there. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with a little will also be dishonest with much. So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who is going to trust you with true riches? If you can't handle money, how can I tell you about the deep spiritual things of God? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who's going to give you your own property to own? No servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he will devote it to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, first thing, Jesus is not praising the dishonest, uh, uh, the dishonesty of the manager, but he is praising and took note of his shrewdness. Second, you have to learn from anybody. You can only learn from people who you agree with 100%. You're not going to learn anything. I'm probably the only person you agree with everything I say. But everybody else can have a valid point as well. Now, <clears throat> nobody's going to agree with you, and you're not going to agree with people that uh, all the time. You know, I think that uh, you don't have to agree with a person's actions or the things that they say in order to learn from them. To learn from them does not mean you agree with them. It means that you saw something in there which you can learn from. This guy's dishonest, Jesus is talking about. You don't want to learn that part. There's something else we want to look at. Uh, he did something right. Now, why did Jesus tell this story about a crook? <clears throat> First, he's talking to the Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? They were arrogant. <laughs> they were not humble. Uh, they were incredibly prideful. They were self-righteous, judgmental. They judged everything and everybody. They were demeaning and demanding. And basically, they didn't like people. <laughs> they were number one hypocrites. And Jesus used to like to poke them in the eye all the time. And uh, he had a tendency to comfort the afflicted, but he also has a tendency to afflict the comforted. And uh, he was afflicting them as often as he could. If you're in pain, any kind of pain, Jesus wants to comfort you. But sometimes you get so comfortable, Jesus needs to afflict you a little bit because he loves you wherever you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay there. And so he keeps us moving. So <laughs> the reason Jesus is telling this thing is because the Pharisees loved money. So obviously, who can relate to the Pharisees best of all? But a crook. The Pharisees dearly loved money. So when they heard this Jesus had said, they made fun of him. But Jesus said, told them, you're always making yourselves look good. But God sees what's in your heart. The things that people think are more important are worthless as far as God is concerned. And that's the phrase we want to look at. The things that we think are important, God says not. What do we think is important? You know, possessions, pleasure, power, prestige, popularity, sex, status, salary, money. All of those things, God says, no. And you'll notice every time we teach this stuff, the teachings of Jesus Christ are totally 
inversion of everything that you learn here. So you have culture's way of living, and you have Jesus' way of living, and they are the diametric opposites. And so the verse that uh, has put into focus the whole series is, don't conform to this world's patterns, but be transformed by the way you think. So we're looking at what areas did God want to transform our life so the first reason he told the story about a crook is because he was talking to Pharisees who love money. The second reason is because most believers are poor managers of money. They have little or no emergency funds. They don't have a retirement saved up. They're living uh, check to check. And uh, I forget what they say. The average American can handle three missed pay periods, and then they're done. Uh, and the Church of Jesus Christ has pretty well followed in that pattern by and large. I mean, there, there's exceptions all over the place turns out to be three percent but uh, so the message is not today about giving and it's not about tithing it's about managing your money well why because God wants you to not be enslaved to money and if you get a debt you're enslaved your, your debt will tell you how much overtime you work your debt will tell you whether you take a vacation your debt will dictate everything in your life you don't manage your money, your money's going to manage you. So he's not praising this guy's dishonesty. He's praising his shrewdness. What do we, what's it mean by shrewdness? The guy was sharp. He was smart. He was just, 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 just. strategic, someone might say. <clears throat> he was resourceful. He saw the problem clearly. And when he saw the problem, he knew what had to be done. So. God wants you to learn to be biblically shrewd with your money for the rest of your life. Five things you need to remember every day of your life, and you do, your stress will go down, your satisfaction will go up. Stress will go down if you follow these five things. Satisfaction will go up. So let's first of all look at four things you don't do with your money. We're just going to go through them quickly. Don't waste it. The manager was accused of wasting his money. You know, it's my money. What I can do whatever I want with it. Actually, it turns out to be God's, and there's a big difference. Don't love it. <coughs> Don't live for it. No servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other, be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve two masters, God and money. So it's impossible to live a divided allegiance. The problem uh, <coughs> at the heart of this problem is the problem of the heart. This is not about money. It's about uh, where you give your heart to, and your heart follows your money. If you're eating at Starbucks or drinking a coffee, it doesn't matter. But if you own the stocks, all of a sudden it does matter. If you own it, you're interested in it. If you own it, you're interested in it. And God says you will be interested in and follow your money. Somebody said that, follow the money. All right. Don't trust it. So don't waste it. Don't love it. Don't trust it. You can lose it. Uh, <laughs> the manager who had a good job up until this point, what am I going to do? I'm losing my job. And so we have to be careful where we build our security into. We build our life on God's love and his love for the relationship. Why? Because there's nothing above the earth, beneath the earth, coming or in the next life that can separate you from God's love. So we need to learn to live in the security that God loves us. And last week we talked about those people who've been exposed face-to-face -face with God. And we said there's like 16 million in the States, 13 million in France, and then Italy, and, the, and <laughs> people who've had... It used to call them after-death experiences, but since science <coughs> doesn't think you can experience anything after death, they've had to change it to near-death experience. But anyways, <coughs> when it doesn't fit with our paradigm, we'll just change what it is we saw, and then everything's cool. So <coughs> here, you can base your life on the love of God. And when those guys saw how much God loved them, they were afraid of nothing after that. They were afraid of nothing. Suddenly they say, oh, his love is real. I am looked after by a God who loves me. The scripture says that in Proverbs, remember Solomon, one of the wealthy, richest and wealthiest men of his time, uh, he wrote down, your money can be gone in a flash as if it had grown wings and flown away like an eagle. Now, isn't that nice? The United States government puts eagles on all their dollars. <laughs> just <to write. laughs> All right. <coughs> Fourthly, don't expect it to satisfy. I love this phrase from Howard Hughes. How much does it take? How much is enough? 
a little bit more. Yeah. And uh, we know that in surveys from uh, times, as long as we've taken surveys, everybody wants to make 5% more than they're making, regardless of what they're making. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. Ecclesiastes, also written by uh, Solomon, uh, puts together these uh, wisdom verses uh, for us to pass down from generation. He actually wrote them for his sons, but we snuck a copy of it. Whoever loves money will never have enough. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with his income. Guard against all kinds of greed. These are the words of Jesus. Because your life is not measured by how much you own. Your self-worth has nothing to do with your net worth. And uh, I thought it was interesting, the one guy who won a huge <coughs> jackpot in the lottery. And he said, I got money now, and everybody wants me to sit on their boards. I have more opportunity. I'm no smarter than I was. I just won the lottery. <laughs> he said, I was dumb before. <laughs> I'm dumb now. I'm just rich and dumb. And he says, Why? they think because I have money, I'm wise. No, your net worth doesn't reflect on your self-worth. Okay, so <clears throat> those are five things we don't want to be. We don't want to conform to the way of this world, but we want to be transformed into the thinking of God. So what are the five things that we need to remember every day? It was interesting when uh, <laughs> King David gathered all of the materials for the temple, but God says, look, you are a mighty warrior. You've killed more people than any person on the planet. You have been a military genius, and uh, I can't get you to build the house of love. David says, okay, if I can't build it, good enough, good enough. We did sort of kick butt here for a few generations, but if I can't build it, can I get the material for it? So David, God says, yes, go ahead. So he gathered all the material. In fact, they were bringing in so much material, they had to say, stop. <laughs> we got a temple and a half here. Just stop bringing it. And then King Solomon designed it. And he built it, his son, David's son. And uh, at the dedication of the temple, when the Spirit of God hit it, he wrote uh, a thing and he says, God, everything is yours. He said, the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the, everything is yours. And he says, who are we that we can give anything back to you? You owned it. We didn't give it to you. We returned to you something that was yours. And uh, the psalm says, everything is the Lord's and everything, the earth and everything in it is his. And so we have to look around and say, yeah, he made it, and he didn't relinquish ownership. He just lets us use it. So you and I are kind of like this uh, steward. We have in our possession another man's goods. And what you think you own, you really don't. It's on loan. And if you think you own your home, just miss three payments. They'll explain it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> like this guy who's managing properties for an owner, you and I are all in management. We're all managers. And uh, we have to realize that these things belong to God. You sit down, you eat a meal, that's God's dishes. You go home, this is God's house. And he loaned it to me for a while. You drive on the way home, this is God's car. Now, why is that a good thing? That's a good thing because if it's rented or borrowed or loaned, it doesn't have the same responsibility. Who has to look after what you own? The owner does. So you can go home and say, God, I think your car needs a valve job. <coughs> Worry goes down. <coughs> you have a fender bender in the parking lot and say, God, your car is a mess. Could you fix it? It's his car. If all of our possessions are his, he'll look after his possessions and me. All right. Here's the point. If I'm in charge and if I'm God, I'm the master of my own fate, and I have to pay and look for resources for everything. I've got to worry about where it's going to come from. But if I'm really a child of God, then my Father will supply. Fair? The first verse of the story says the owner enlisted a manager to take care of his property. We're all managers. He's speaking to every one of us who handle his wealth. Now... <laughs> God also uses money to test us. That's the second thing we have to remember every day. The first thing we have to remember is who owns it. The second thing is God uses it as a test. Now, what does that mean? The test at the end was if I can't trust you with a little, I can't show you deep spiritual truths. If I can't touch, test, trust you with material things, how in the world can I trust you with a deep spiritual truths 
of God. And why does he use money as a test? Because money shows what we love. Money shows what we love. You want to know what you think are your priorities in life? Just flip through your checkbook, your account. I guess you don't use checkbooks anymore. But let's say this is the old days and we used to use a checkbook. <laughs> All right, pull your bank account up on the screen. <laughs> and look where your money goes. That's where your heart is. That's what you love. There's just no two ways about it. And uh, so money shows truly where your affections lie. And Jesus says, look, if we're going to be attached to God, if he's going to be the first priority of our life, then all priorities have to go around that. And if our money doesn't go around God, then we love money more than God. And that's a problem. So at the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Where has the heart attached itself? Money shows that we really, what we really trust. Money shows what we really trust. You know, <laughs> we were talking about the fact that uh, we found a bunch of money I hadn't paid tax on, so I'm going back and refiling. If, what do I trust? Do I trust God to help me? Do I trust God? enough that I can relax. You ask. Who's afraid of the IRS? <laughs> if you trust yourself, you're going to be high stress. If you trust God, you can relax and give it into his hands. Amen? If you trust God, money is a test of who you trust. How you solve problems shows up in who you trust. And so why does he use money? It tells him a lot about us and our heart, mainly our heart. At the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And money is the best gauge of where our heart is of anybody. If you <laughs> Proverbs, again, written by Solomon. He wrote these wise things to pass down to his kids. If you, if you're, if you trust in your money, you will fall. But if you trust in God, you will flourish like Roots go down, everything else is dried up, but you stand there in a wilderness dried out like a green tree that flourishes. All right. S the other thing is it shows if God can trust me. Money shows do I trust God, but it also shows can God trust me. Now, What he places in our hands, he places it there as an act of trust. When your kids go to university and you send off a lot of money, <laughs> you trust them <laughs> to study, <laughs> and uh, it's an act of trust. And God puts a lot of resources our way. He just trusts you. And the amount that he can trust you is the gauge of how much he can bless you. Does that make sense? Some people, you don't give them a big job to do. You just give them a little job. Why? Because there's a real good chance they're going to screw it up. <laughs> and so if they're building the foundation, that's not a place to check it out. Okay? But if this is a rock-solid person, they can oversee the whole project because you trust them. What God places in our hands tells us how much he can trust us. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. Uh, when God looks at you, he will give you as much as he can trust you. Now, and the other thing is, whatever he gives you, you don't have to worry about because you don't own it anyways. Now, <laughs> uh, money is a tool. I don't think we look at it this way, but he says, how do you use money? And uh, Jesus is saying, I will tell you to use your earthly wealth. He said, use your earthly wealth to build his kingdom, to build relationships, to guide and help people into God's presence. What's the two movies that are showing now? God is not dead and son of God, right? How do you invest? You pick up the tab, take someone with you, go see a movie, and go right crazy and also pay for dinner afterwards. I mean, just go nuts, but use your money to build a kingdom. Boy, does it get quiet in here? 
Whoa. <laughs> One nerve and I just stepped on it. Okay. <laughs> Invest in God's kingdom. Use your money. And if you don't like them, buy one of those big things of popcorn, put palm oil all over it. They're gone in a week, okay? Their heart just plugged up. No, don't do that. <laughs> invest. He says it's a tool. And then he says if you invest it, you get into his presence, and there are many people waiting for you, and they say, I'm so glad you took the time to introduce me to your Jesus. Amen? That's what our life is about, introducing people to Jesus. Now, the other thing that this guy did was he looked ahead. He saw, whoops, I'm about to lose my job. He planned, anticipated, and he made a plan. So he looked ahead. The wise man looks ahead. A fool attempts to fool himself and won't face the facts. When you look ahead, where are you? And in handling your resources, make a plan. So he made the plan. He says, I know what I'll do. Now, the question is here, do you know where you are financially? God's teaching for finances is know the condition of your flocks. Now, if you don't have a sheep, he might be returning to know what your assets are, know where you are, know what your net worth is. And he says, <coughs> if you're going to work with me, we have to know what we're working with. And so, and then once you know what you have and where you are, then you make a plan. And Proverbs says, again, we're reading from Solomon, this is why it's wisdom literature for his kids. And he says, we should make plans counting on God to direct us. In all your ways, acknowledge God. In all your ways, work with God. He's trying to help you. So make the plan and lie on God and act quickly. This, this money manager, he don't waste any time. There's no moss growing on this rolling stone. So he, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job, people will welcome me into the house. And he kicked into gear. So those are the things involved with the resources and uh, wise use. Now, see that? I haven't asked you for any money yet. Money's a tool. Money's a tool. And God wants you to use it wisely. Any of you guys have a men, or when you were a kid, did you have a jackknife? Did you? Yeah. And what did your dad say? It's not a screwdriver and don't throw it in the dirt. <laughs> it's a tool. Did your dad tell you not to throw it in the ground? No? Yeah. We used to play that game and uh, drive my dad nuts. That's a knife! No, it's a thrower. <laughs> Stretch. That's it. Yeah, you were a reprobate too. Okay, so... <clears throat> Use the tool properly. Jesus is saying, look, this is a tool. Use it to build the kingdom. Now, the fourth best use of money is to get people into heaven. Jesus says in verse 9 here, this is the same scripture. We're back to the story. I tell you, worldly wealth, to use your money, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. So when it is gone, you will be welcomed into your eternal dwelling. You'll be welcomed into your eternal dwelling. That means when you get to heaven... You've used your resources, and there's a whole bunch of people <laughs> that you've used your worldly wealth to get them into the presence of God. And it says, then they will welcome you. In that verse, circle that phrase, then they will welcome you. This is about you reaching people for God. This is about you being a priest for the king of kings. This is about you uh, building the kingdom of God. This is about you serving Jesus Christ. And when you serve Jesus Christ, he loves every single person. It's his desire that every single person on the earth come into a relationship with him. And he's saying, use your money as a tool to help me achieve my objectives, which is every single person on the face of the earth in my presence at the end of time. So we use our money as a tool to help him accomplish his goal. La and, ver and five, we'll have to give an account to God. Uh, any of you guys work for a company and have to do inventory? Anybody? Inventory? Two, three, inventory? Yeah. What is that? You shut the whole place down, and you count everything in there. And then you <coughs> say how much you have <laughs> versus how much you're supposed to have. And uh, uh, my suspicion is computers are always wrong. So that's an accounting. Give an account. You've been managing my business. Shrinkage is 3%. Your shrinkage is 15. 
I ain't going to hold you accountable. Does that make sense? He says, I placed all this stuff in your hand. You're managing it. And someday you and I are going to talk about it. Did you use it as a tool to grow my kingdom? Did you use any of the stuff I put in your hand to help me achieve my objective, which is every person? I love them all. You don't even like them, but God loves them. They are desired by God. He wants them to be his children. Will you help him with the use of your resources? And then he says, let's talk. <laughs> when God says, let's talk, it can be great or it can be bad. Now, last if I'm faithful with a little, God can trust me with more. <laughs> you know, we talked about uh, God, if you let God have ownership of it, he'll look after it. We, we sometimes struggle with that. Is that true? If I say, God, your car has a dent in it, will he look after his car? Or am I just making this up? I remember <laughs> I had a, a company, <coughs> and uh, I was... Uh, getting ready to computerize it, and uh, I'm laying in bed, and a, a dream came to me, know the condition of your flocks. I said, stop it, I'm trying to sleep. Next night, know the condition of your flocks. Leave me alone, I'm trying to, at, at night after night, know the condition of your flocks. And since it wasn't a sheep business, what I did was, did an audit. Guess what? My manager was stealing thousands and thousands of dollars. Why did God wake me up in the middle of the night to tell me to go check whose inventory is it? His. It's his business if you give it to him, it's his car, it's his house. He woke me up in the middle of it, thank you for that, and <laughs> said, go check your business. Why? Because it's his. If you will give it to God, he will look after it. And if he can trust you to look after it well, he will bless you. Does that, does that make sense? Are we, are we on a common path here? Rick Warren, uh, when you get into the video, oh, you've already seen the video uh, in your small group. That story is so revealing. He has a, a, one of the best sellers of all time, second only to the Bible. And uh, he doesn't keep hardly any of it. He gives 91% in tithe and lives off the rest. And uh, he was jokingly saying, I could have bought a desert island <laughs> and sat around and uh, have them serve me uh, lemonade with a little... Uh, umbrella in it the rest of my life. But God says, no, use your money as a tool to build my kingdom. So he's turning almost all of his resources, just keeping a little bit to live on, giving it to God to build his kingdom. What a concept. It's almost like it's in the owner's manual. And why did Rick Warren get that? I think the problem is if he'd have given it to some of us, we'd have bought the island and sat around drinking lemonade with little umbrellas in it. But he says, I can trust Rick Warren. And he gave him millions. Why? Because Rick Warren said, this is not mine, this is God's. How do you want to use it, God? And he gave it back to him. Would you stand with me? Remember that everything you read in God's word, this is a... <coughs> Authors, through 1,400 years, put together this manual for you to have a better life. This teaching this morning is teachings from God's uh, owner's manual to you. And everything in it is so he can bless you. This morning, he says, transform how you think about your money. And if I can trust you to give you a lot of money, if you'll use it to build my kingdom, I'll trust you. This is the teaching this morning. God owns it all. And I love that story of Rick Warren. He gave him millions because he could trust him. Not to buy an island <laughs> with it. If he gave you millions, what would you do with it? 
And the answer is we build God's kingdom. Amen? We use our resources. If we only have a little, we use a little bit of resources to build God's kingdom. If he does something really crazy and we become multimillionaire, we use it all to build God's kingdom. Our purpose in life is the same, little or lot. And if he can trust you with a little, he'll give you a lot. Amen? Our Heavenly Father, we're going to take a minute now, and we're going to remember that you are the one who paid the ultimate sacrifice for our life. You uh, hung on that cross. We're coming into uh, <coughs> Good Friday uh, when you held back the forces of heaven from coming down and rescuing you. You went the whole way. At any time, you could have cried out to your father and our father, come down and kill all these people, but you didn't. You stayed on the cross until you cried out, it is finished. And from that time on, Satan has been defeated. And when you came back out of the grave, into life again. You said, because I live, you are going to live also. So when we talk about the future, we're talking about the promises you made to us, which are sealed on the cross. And so today, we remember the cross. We remember the price. We are free only because you paid the price. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and have a, a, a moment of communion with us now. If you've never had communion with us here, this is not about the community church. This is about the worldwide church of God. Every person who's a follower of Jesus Christ is asked by Jesus to do this and remember him. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he asked you to do this so you could remember him. So anybody around the world this morning is probably having communion uh, because we did it. They'll, they'll copy us. So now here's how we do it in this body of Christ. We take some uh, unleavened bread because there is an association as an illustration between leaven and sin. And so you don't have to. You can use real bread. But we use uh, flat bread, and we dip it into the grape juice. And this is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the price. And you can take a minute and say, thank you, Lord. You paid the price. It's just a thanksgiving. It's a thanksgiving. Thank you, God. And then remember, Everything in your hands is his. Let's use it to build the kingdom. And you don't have to go back to your seat. Let's just, if you do go back to your seat, let's just sit quietly and talk to God. Now, if you want to come up here and just pull off to the side and talk to God before you go back to the seat, please do it. But if you go back to your seat, just have a conversation with God. He loves you. It's the greatest thrill of God's life is when you sit down and slow down and talk to him. You're his kid. How many moms here love it when their kid calls home? Yeah, yeah. God loves it when his kids call home too. Sit down, call home, give thanks. God loves you.